and I took a video in my empty college dorm room and I just was telling people that right now I'm leaving everything behind and chasing my lifelong dream of being an alligator wrestler. And then I looked at the camera and went, whatever your dream is, it probably sounds more realistic than mine and I'm still pursuing mine. And two years later, look where I'm at. Hey, this is Kevin Snakeaholic Pavlidis, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Hey, everybody, welcome to the podcast today. Kevin Pavlidis is the Snakeaholic, and the Snakeaholic is his. Uh, social media handle that he goes by on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all of the different uh, platforms. That's his That's his handle. So you can follow him at Snakeaholic. And I uh, wanted to start with that because he's doing some really cool stuff. In fact, he just caught the state record python, Burmese python. The thing was over 18 feet long. Uh, ridiculously huge snake. Uh, but Kevin is an interesting guy because He has been handling snakes since he was seven years old. He has handled all different kinds of snakes, and that led him to also working with the Gator Boys from Animal Planet, that show, a very popular show. They have uh, a show at Everglades Holiday Park outside of Fort Lauderdale, and Kevin is one of the team members there that handles alligators. So on one side of his life, he's, he's protecting and handling native species. On the other side of his life, he is going after invasive species like the Burmese python. So he knows a tremendous amount about all of these animals that he's going after. He's obviously spent his entire life studying these animals. And um, it was no surprise when I heard him talk that we later found out that he has a degree in finance from a a Northeastern University. Uh, The guy's very smart. Very smart guy that is doing this because he loves to do this. And it didn't come without uh, a, a period, uh, without a a point in his life to where he had to make this decision. Is he going down this road or is he going to follow his passion and go down a road less traveled? That's exactly what he did. That leads him to being a full-time reptile hunter, really. He wrestles alligators. He goes after snakes. He is the snakeaholic. Great conversation. Here we go. Go to boathammockstands.com and get a stand that goes right in your rod holder. It allows you to hang a hammock from your boat or in your boat, I should say. You'll have the most comfortable boat on the sandbar or if you go on overnight trips. It's fantastic for that as well. Barracuda Tackle is a place where we get our cast nets. They make awesome cast nets. They have tons you can choose from there. Go to barracudatackle.com, and they have tons of other stuff besides cast nets as well. It's a great resource. And we have Empire Boat Covers. Empire Boat Covers is a very good place to get an affordable boat cover. Go to empirecovers.com forward slash TRP, and you can keep all those leaves from falling in your boat. It's fall. It's about to happen. You need to cover up all your stuff. A boat cover is a fantastic way to take care of your boats, but they have all kinds of covers. Boat covers for your car, for your RV, for your grill. They have covers for everything that you can imagine. And if you go to empirecovers.com forward slash TRP, you can get 15% off your order and free shipping. So don't forget to use that code TRP to take advantage of that. And now we're getting back to the show. Kevin, man, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm, honestly, I'm a little tired. You know, I was catching snakes last night, so I got back at four in the morning. So a little bit sleep deprived, but feeling great, man. And the snake catching is what caught my eye about you and made me want to have you on the podcast. Um, that is nocturnal work for the most part. Depends on the time of year. So same thing as a lot of other animals, through, especially with reptiles. You know, as the year changes, the temperatures change, their circadian rhythm kicks in, stuff like that, they're going to behave differently. So for majority of the year, these are predominantly nocturnal animals. And by snakes, again, I specifically mean Burmese pythons, which are invasive in South Florida, and I'm contracted to catch them for the state. 
Now, for most of the year, the temperatures are very hot in South Florida. So these animals become almost exclusively nocturnal. And that's for most of the year. Now, once we get into the winter season where we do get these cold fronts coming through, that will kick them into a daytime activity and you can get them out during the day, which is a lot easier on me because <laughs> I get to sleep like a normal person for a, just a couple months out of the year before I go back to being a maniac that's up all night. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine in the in the summertime that that is going to be super nocturnal. But is there a is there a condition like when a real, real serious cold front comes through that makes it just the easiest for catching snakes? Like if it gets real cold, is that is there a condition that that's easier than others? I guess you said like in the cooler months for sure, but I would say it's, it's actually easier during the summer when you're chasing that nocturnal activity, because these are pretty, they're predators. So they want to remain hidden because they are stalking. So in the summer, when we're getting them at night, they're under the illusion that they can't be seen. So a lot of times it's actually really anticlimactic captures. You just walk up and just pick them up because <laughs> they don't think you can see them. But during the day is actually the trickiest because they're well aware that they're visible. And I've had many more snakes during the day take off on me and I had to run down and dive on them than in the summer months where it's at night and they just think no one can see them. Wow. So this snake population has has gone completely out of control. Is that I mean, it seems that way. I mean, when I get on Instagram and I see you and others catching these things and then the state has now contracted a bunch of hunters for them, what would you say the the status of the of the python Burmese python um, population in the Everglades is right now? It's pretty bad. <laughs> it's pretty high. Uh, I won't sugarcoat it like anything else, um, but there's a lot of them. Uh, I can break down the exact numbers for you by my calculations. If you're interested. Yeah. Okay. So when now th there's a little bit in here that might be a little bit controversial. So again, I'm just going to say, this is my opinion based on the facts that I've seen. When you talk to a lot of people, they'll say there's a hundred thousand to 300,000 pythons in the Everglades. When you actually look at the science, you realize that that number didn't actually come from anywhere. <laughs> no, like somebody just made it up and everyone decided to go with it. So that's not rooted in science. What we can root in science though, is they did a study in North Carolina in a captive environment where they released a bunch of Burmese pythons into an enclosure, sent in trained people to go look for them. And through that study, they found that the species detection rate for Burmese pythons is one half to one whole percent of the actual population. Now, you take into account the number of snakes we've caught as a program. Uh, collectively, South Florida Water Management District and FWC actually just hit 6,000, you know, a couple, couple weeks ago. But at the time when I first did this calculation, it was 5,000, which is a lot easier to work with. <laughs> so you take five, you take 5,000 pythons we've removed from the Everglades, multiply that by one half to one whole percent. Now remember, one half to one whole percent means out of 200 pythons that are there, statistically, you're going to detect one or two of them out of 200. Wow. Now take that 5,000 that we've caught, multiply that by one half to one whole percent. And you're looking at a conservative 500,000 estimate and then a less conservative, a million pythons, right? And then you take into consideration the fact that we're only really finding them along roadways and levee systems. And you look at the expanse of the Everglades and realize just how vast that wilderness is. And personally, I think there's a couple million of them out there <laughs> when you take all that into consideration. Man. So... And that doesn't, I don't, I don't say that to be pessimistic. That's just my realistic view of it as I see it now. So the, the follow-up question that everybody always asks is, are we ever going to get rid of them? Personally, I don't think so. <laughs> and I don't say that to be pessimistic at all. It's just the vastness of the Everglades and how well built these animals are for it. I, I just don't see with the technology we have right now, how to eliminate them. Now. But to turn the positive spin on that, 
that means that when I go out there, my goal is not getting rid of every single Python because I don't think it's practical. However, my view is every single Python that we remove is one less apex predator, one less invasive apex predator in our local ecosystem consuming our native wildlife. So you take that apex predator out and it gives our native animals a chance to rebound and a chance to be, you know, a little get a little edge up on the invasives and hopefully strengthen their population a little bit. Yeah. So that's how I always look at it. Interesting. I wonder what do you what are your thoughts on um you know like let's just say you have guppies in a in a fish tank and you have a, a small fish bowl and mm-hmm. guppies are just as prolific as they would normally be but they're only going to be so many that can live in that small fish bowl. Then you get a 55 gallon aquarium and you have the same guppies in there and maybe they can reproduce and reproduce and reproduce but still they're going to be limited to the 55 gallon aquarium. Then you get a 200 gallon aquarium and and you know a species is kind of um going to reproduce and proliferate and thrive to a point of its um, environment, right? Like how much food is there, yeah. how much, uh, territory there is, how much predation by you and, and other people. Um, is there a point where the Everglades would self-regulate? Like if they ate all the, all the, uh, uh, native species, if, if is there, what is your thought on that? Like, we do predict that that will happen eventually. I mean, the term to throw in there is carrying capacity. Right. Inevitably, we probably will hit that point where we've hit the carrying capacity and there's not, you know, that they'll start to exhibit some sort of population decline. But by the time that happens, oh man, that's (laughs) going to be pretty devastating. Um, Because remember again, that, that these are, these are reptiles. They don't, need that much food to survive. These are built to survive. So they actually don't eat too, too, like each individual doesn't normally need to eat a crazy amount to survive. Now they are opportunistic predators and they will take an easy meal given the chance. So it's going to be longer than if you were dealing with mammals Mm -hmm. because mammals need food more regularly. So they would run out of it and it would be a bigger issue. Uh, but the other thing to keep into account is that Florida does have a lot of stuff like migratory birds that they can capitalize in. So what we have seen is that as they devour a certain group of animals, they just start to shift to a different group. So what we've noticed on with the pythons on the East Coast, well, we call it the East. It's not really the coast, but the Eastern Everglades area is that they've borderline eliminated mammals from the equation. Like when you go out into areas that are really dense in pythons, you're not going to see raccoons. You're not going to see bobcat. You're not going to see a possum. You won't see foxes. Like they're gone. They ate them all. So they've moved on to now majority of their diet. You know, it's about 70% birds and alligators in and 30% mammals, mostly consisting of stuff like rats that they can still find. Wow. So if you go into a place and you're not seeing any of those animals, you're not seeing any raccoons, you're not seeing any any of the animals that you mentioned, does that mean that there are that's probably a really good place to find pythons? Or does that mean that they've already been there and now they have moved on to try to find more of that food? Like, see what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it probably means there's a lot there. Whew. That's really, yeah, it just means it's probably a really good place to find them. And that's always struck me as so, it always blows me away. The, the time that it hits me is when I get out of South Florida and I go a, like an hour or two north and I go out into the prairies and stuff like that. And I get out on dirt roads and there's mammal tracks covering the dirt road. Just everywhere you walk, it's just all mammal tracks. And that always strikes me like, wow, that's incredible, but it shouldn't be. (laughs) And I think about it and that's when the gears start turning that, why is this so impressive to me? And it's because I'm always in the Python areas where there are no mammals. So I get out of the car. I don't see footprints on the ground. I don't see mammal tracks. I don't see signs of mammals because they're just not there. Wow. So 
Yeah, that's when it always hits me is when I get out of South Florida and realize what the mammal population should be like. So in your opinion, what is the what is the the defining kind of line uh, north to south where uh, where the pythons kind of are, are not anymore? So we say they generally have made it as far as the bottom of Lake Okeechobee. And south, they've already gone all the way through the Keys and everything. So pretty much it's just the entire <laughs> expanse of the Everglades from Lake Okeechobee south. Now, once you get into those more northern sections, bottom of Lake Okeechobee, Palm Beach County, stuff like that, they're not nearly as densely populated, but they are there and their numbers are rising slowly. Hmm. Wow. And, and you say that you mentioned the keys, is that mm -hmm. well known that there are tons of big ones in the keys? I wouldn't say tons of big ones, but it's been well documented for many years that they've made it into the keys at this point. Um, really the, the big one that they're worried about is the key Largo wood rat. I believe that's the species because yeah. that's actually an endangered species. And they're really worried about pythons getting in there because they have done it before where they have radio transmitters in the rats and they track them out and find the transmitter inside a Python. Yeah. And they're like, damn it. <laughs> yeah, the same thing happens with sharks and bonefish and stuff like that. Like they'll, they'll, they'll ping these fish and then they find out that they're, they're inside of a shark, <laughs> you know, but that's more normal. That's all, that's all native species competing over their native territory. This is something entirely different where you have an invasive species and that's where, that's where a lot of people, um, or some people, not really South Florida people, but a lot of people listen to this podcast all over the world, actually. So I think it is, is kind of interesting to kind of go back through the history of why these snakes are being hunted, why they are trying to be um, uh, eliminated out of the Everglades. And, and when we say the Everglades, uh, it's not just the Everglades National Park that we're talking about, but what would you define the kind of borders of, of what you would consider the Everglades when you say the Everglades? It's just, I mean, so South Florida, that whole Everglades ecosystem is basically the watershed from Lake Okeechobee south out to the ocean. It's basically a giant, slow flowing river. Everyone calls it the river of grass. And basically it's just a whole watershed coming down from Lake Okeechobee out into the ocean. So that entire area, I forget the exact numbers, but I believe it's like 78 million square miles or something like that. We actually, I looked it up the other day and somebody said that it's over more than six times the size of Rhode Island. Wow. Is, you know, one of those areas. So it's a very, very vast area. Yeah. Much bigger than just what, what we refer to as the Everglades National Park. And that's where a lot of people get, yeah. get confused is, is uh, you know, they're thinking just the Everglades National Park, but the Everglades is kind of a general, general term for that big area that you described. Yeah. So, uh, let's talk about the history about how these snakes get here just for people that might not be quite aware of what happened uh, and how this happened and how, how there's now, you know, some figures between a hundred thousand and a million pythons running wild out there. So how did that happen in your, in your opinion? Yeah. Again, we don't know anything a hundred percent. The only thing we know a hundred percent is that these snakes were brought in through the pet trade with the intention of being pets. Enough of them got loose one way or another that they found each other, started breeding and they've now established themselves very well into the Everglades ecosystem. Uh, an important thing to talk about too is just invasive species as a whole. So invasive species is actually the second leading cause of global extinction. So it goes habitat loss is number one cause of global extinction. Invasive species is number two, right below it. So that's how big of an issue invasive species are. Now you take into account that this is an apex predator that's an invasive species and that already has a much more profound impact on the ecosystem and the other thing is that south florida has the highest rate of invasive species anywhere else on the planet wow. right here in south florida so the, i mean the biggest problem really is that our climate is so suitable to all these animals we have non-native animals released all over the united states all over the world every day but in most places the animals don't survive 
we, I'm sure for a fact, there's been plenty of Burmese pythons that have been released by irresponsible pet owners, you know, up in New York and stuff like that. It just gets too cold. They die in the winter. But down here, they all survive. And that's where this is really stemmed from is our climate is so good for them. Right. Do you know, um, interesting, I never really thought about this, but is there any other invasive species that the python sees as, as prey, like an iguana or, or something oh, yeah. else? They're eating those a lot. So, I mean, it, do, yeah. do you see a decrease in other invasive species because of the python in some cases? I wouldn't say that we see a decrease because of it, but we have definitely found them, you know, with iguanas in their stomachs or constricting iguanas actively in the moment. But that kind of, for me, just shows like how bad South Florida is with invasive species that we have invasive species eating other invasive species. So it, yeah, it's pretty, pretty bad. I mean, pretty much any group of animal you can think of South Florida has an invasive species in that category. Wow. That's incredible. You know, when I, I had a neighbor in the keys that had two, I guess they were Burmese pythons. They were enormous snakes, enormous. Like when I see the one that you caught, that was a state record. I'm thinking yeah. this thing was close to that size, like really <laughs> big. You know, he he grew the thing, and he used to he used to yeah. take it out of the cage that he had it in, and he would stretch it out in the yard. And I was like, man, if that thing got out, I don't know how long that is. I mean, the one you caught was a massive, but let's just say this one was was 12 feet long. Yeah, I mean, if that thing got out in the keys, yeah, we. It, it would just survive. Like there's plenty yeah. to eat there. There's tons of stuff to eat. And I guess that's pretty much how it happens that these snakes are being released by, by irresponsible pet owners, either accidentally or on purpose because they get too big. They can't feed them. They can't afford to feed them anymore. I mean, how much would that snake eat? Let's say, let's just say you had a 12 foot Python. Uh, how much does that thing eat? How much, what kind of, financial responsibility and where would you even find all the stuff to feed it? Yeah. I mean, they actually don't eat too, too often, especially in captivity. Cause remember that is a, you know, in captivity, the animals are comparatively lazy. They just sit around all day. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, is this lighting good? I turn the yeah. light on cause yeah, we've got good. cloud cover. So they, um, yeah, they pretty much an animal that size in captivity, you honestly only need to feed it like, maybe once a month at a that month? point. Wow. Yeah. That, Cause they're, they're very, very good at, at energy conservation. Um, now it, it kind of depends on the individual and it depends on the situation and the size of the meal that you're giving it. But, uh, I have a personal friend who had an 17, 18 foot reticulated Python and he would feed it once every three months and he'd feed it like several, like I, like, you know, a several full size rabbits like wow. the, yeah, that's, so it, it, it can get expensive. Um, uh, but I also had a, I had a, <laughs> I used to work for a guy when I lived in New York and he had a, a big 12 foot Burmese Python. And one of the things he would do is to feed it is literally just go to the, the grocery store and just buy a whole chicken. And he had the thing trained that it would just eat the chicken. <laughs> so wow. he was definitely saving money by feeding it that instead of getting like the high grade, you know, rabbits and stuff like that, like right. yeah, just chicken. So, wow, that's crazy. But, so one of the things that I noticed in, in just the way that you're, you're talking is that you, you, um, you talk about the Burmese Python and that's what you talked about with the, the numbers that we were talking about in the Everglades. But then you mentioned a reticulated Python and I'm sure there's many other types of pythons, but you yeah. don't really talk about the other ones in, in, terms of the Everglades, are they not as prolific or do, have they not taken off as much or are they just as much of a problem, but the Burmese is the one that you target? The Burmese is the biggest problem. It's the most widespread. It's the highest volume that we're dealing with. There are isolated populations of other species, other invasive large constrictor species. Uh, we have a known breeding population of red tail boas. Uh, but they're actually fairly confined to one area in South Florida and they haven't really, they've been there for many, many years and they haven't spread. So it's not as big of an issue and they are a smaller species. 
Uh, we have African rock pythons. Those are also here, but again, much smaller, much smaller populations, not nearly as widespread. Uh, they do get almost as big as the Burmese, but they just, they're not built for the habitat and the habitat's not perfect for them in the same way it is for Burmese. They haven't really taken off. And then we've had isolated occurrences where we believe there might be a population of breeding rainbow boas or something like that. But again, those are smaller species. So Burmese is definitely the big one. It's definitely the most widespread. It has the most impact. There's the most of them. But there are definitely other invasive constrictors down here. And unfortunately, with a lot of them, it's still a little bit up in the air of whether a population can establish itself. Hmm. So we don't really know. But with every single passing year, FWC cranks down on the regulations and makes them tighter and tighter. So it's harder to get these animals. It's harder to possess them, which, you know, I, which, you know the, the goal is then it's harder for them to get out because less people have them. The people that do have them are going to be more responsible about it. So it's probably not going to turn into a big issue, but that's their planning ahead of time, just trying to, it, you know. Do you see that, I mean, this happens with so many other things that once the regulations, uh, I mean, you take drugs, for example, it, you make drugs super illegal. Well, there becomes a black market immediately for those those drugs, like, and what you're saying is like the FWC is cranking down on all these regulations about owning these species that would be invasive if they were released. Does that create an immediate black market for the pet trade? Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. And that yeah. that can be like worse because the people that want them, they want them. They're just gonna they're gonna get them illegally, Ill, legally, whatever. And who knows yeah. what they're doing with them, but. I don't know that that, do you think that that makes a difference? Like those regulations? I think it definitely does make a difference. Uh, it is, I feel that it's kind of unfortunate that we have to go to those lengths, but it is making a difference because just, just less people have them in general. I mean, when you talk about, you know, back in the day when Burmese pythons were first kind of brought into the pet trade here, every single pet store had them. Mm, like yeah. you could, any day you wanted to, you could find a pet store, go down, buy a Burmese python as a as a baby and bring it home. And the growth rate on these animals is ridiculous if they're properly fed. Say, Talk about that. How, how fast will one of these grow? <laughs> it's, it's pretty shocking. So the way that Burmese pythons work, uh, remember, these are big apex predators. And in the same way that, you know, fish do the same thing, a lot of reptiles do the same thing. Same thing with alligators, same thing with pythons, same thing with, you know, like tuna and stuff like that. They're going to have a ton of babies because they anticipate that naturally one or two of them will make it to adulthood and the rest will get eaten. So these Burmese pythons have very, very large clutch sizes. I would say that the average python I catch that's gravid or pregnant, you know, full of eggs she will have somewhere in that uh, around 30 eggs is probably average, but those are for smaller snakes. I'm talking like 11, 11 foot somewhere mm -hmm. like 10, 11 foot somewhere in that size range. The bigger ones I've personally, every single breeding season, I will catch a female that has over 70 eggs in it. One as big as the one that we just caught, which broke the state record, that snake potentially could have 120 eggs in a clutch. Wow. So huge clutch sizes. Wow. Now those eggs are extremely fertile. They have over a 90% hatch out rate based on the science. Uh, so majority of them are going to hatch, if not all of them, when they do hatch out, they're about two feet long, which is already about the size of a lot of our native species. And as, so remember those our native species are that size. So the predators are designed for that size. Now they start growing very, very rapidly. Now those snakes are born in June, July, August, somewhere in that range. By the time we hit now where we're in October, they've pretty much doubled in size, if not more than that. Within the first year, it is very possible for them to go from two feet out of the egg to five foot in the wow. first year, five, six foot. Very, what, very possible. What, what kind of animals does a five foot Burmese python eat? What would their prey be? At that point, they're probably still on mostly rats and birds. And I mean, when they're younger, they'll literally, they'll eat anything that they can 
really get a hold of frogs, you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. But a- as they go up, it was a really, really interesting thing too, is that, well, actually, let me just add one more thing before I go down that rabbit hole. But with, in terms of size, how quickly they grow, we have had one individual that was radio tracked from a hatchling to in one year, it was, I think a little over seven feet, seven foot eight, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what it was. So in one year, it became seven foot eight, but it's not, it's pretty realistic to assume that there'll be five to six feet within a year. That's already at the top tier for most of our native snakes. Most of our native snakes do not get that big. So you got to think then that the predators are aligned for that. They're aligned for snakes that big. By the second year, they'll be in that, you know, seven, eight foot class, maybe even the nine foot class is potential. And after that, they pretty much surpassed all of our native snakes. They don't have many, they don't, pretty much don't have any predators at that point. It pretty much comes down to people, alligators, and cars <laughs> once they reach a certain size. And then with alligators, it starts to become whoever grabs who first at a certain size. It can come down to that. Now, the uh, the prey items, yeah. So when, when they're younger, they're targeting you know smaller prey items. The really interesting thing is as they get older, you would think they target larger prey items, which is true because they now have that ability. However, the research actually shows that they don't stop eating the smaller prey items. They just also eat bigger ones. Mm -hmm. So a 13 foot Burmese Python will still eat rats when given the chance. Wow. Pretty crazy. Wow. Yeah. And, and I mean, they don't have to eat that often is what you're saying too. So like if a rat runs in yeah. front of it, it's going to eat it, but it might also yeah. take a small deer or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're extremely good at energy conservation, but at the same time, they're extremely opportunistic and there's so, just such an abundance of food down here that they're just always ready for it. So anytime that a prey item comes through, boom, they're going to take it. Why not? Hmm. And again, one of the reasons for that is in their native range in Southeast Asia, they experience you know, raining seasons and dry seasons, which we do have them too in Florida. But what you got to think about that is that they're going to go through periods where there's a lot of food and then periods where there's not a lot of food. And they'll constantly be going back and forth through that. So when there's a lot of food around, they want to bulk up. So they're going to be ready for that drought season. But with all the animals that we have in our ecosystem here, they almost never really hit that drought season because right. there's always a prey item for them. So they just keep eating and eating and eating aggressively and just keep growing. And their survival rate for the babies is so much higher than calculated. And it just keeps going like that. And yeah, you scale it out yeah. pretty, that's the, pretty quickly. That's the recipe for, for a complete explosion. And that's exactly what's happened. I mean, that's, that's the way that you describe that. If you put that in terms of, of any sort of like an invasive fish, like a lionfish, it's kind of a similar kind of thing. Like there are no yep. predators. They they grow quickly. They eat everything, and it becomes a problem real, real fast. Especially when the water's warm, or you know the 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 South Florida is warm. It's a perfect habitat, and then it just kind of explodes. You know a ton about all these snakes and reptiles. How did that? How did you learn all of this? Yeah. So one of the big misconceptions, I think the the wrong impression that people have about our Python contractors, as you would say it, or contracted Python hunters, however people say it, is that we don't like snakes. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Pretty much everyone that I've ever run into that's a contractor, we all love snakes. We've been playing with them since we were little kids. We've always loved wildlife. And it's not about that. It's about wildlife conservation. It's about protecting our native species by removing an invasive predator, not because they're snakes, but because they're invasive. So me, I've been playing with snakes since I was a little kid. I'm admittedly, I'm a Steve Irwin child. You know, that's what I grew up on yeah. watching. It was really the stem for, you know, my niche for reptiles. But since I was a kid, anything that moved around, anything like I just wanted to play with all of it. And just the older I got, the bigger and more dangerous the animals got. And I really started that niche for snakes around seven years old and just kind of took it from there and scaled it up. What kind of snakes were you uh, having any sort of experience with as a kid? 
So I grew up in, in New York and uh, in Long Island, New York, which is an amazing place for reptiles. <laughs> Just kidding. But <laughs> it, uh, yeah, so I was mostly dealing with like little garter snakes and stuff like that. And I started, you know, gradually scaling it up. So again, I started handling snakes when I was seven years old and I handled my first venomous snakes when I was 16, I believe. And then I started scaling up from there. And I've actually been working with Burmese Python since I was 11 years old. I used to help out with this guy that did reptile shows. And we always had, you know, he had a ton of different animals. So Burmese pythons was one of the ones that we had. And I've been working with them since I was 11 years old and just playing with them. How do you get started with a venomous snake? What What is the what is the starter, <laughs> the the easiest venomous snake to, to handle? Like, I mean, that's got to be yeah. quite a jump. Like, it's like, okay, you make a mistake with a with a python, it hurts. But you make a mistake yeah. with this thing and, and it's a real problem. Yeah, it, really, the handling is exactly the same. There's really nothing different about the handling. It's just that the stakes are higher. Yeah. So, but that's kind of everything that I do in my life. I, I kind of had that that realization moment the other day that when you work with the kind of animals that I work with, more so the alligators and the pythons, it's like if you make one mistake, that's all you get. You get one mistake. So there is no room for error. And it's the same thing when you're working with venomous snakes. Your your room for error is so so slim like you can't make a mistake and if you do you need to know how to get out of it like that so really i just i was just handling non-venomous snakes for many many years and i knew the the movements how to read the body language is really what it really comes down to because again there's not really anything verbal or anything it's all about body language and just communicating with contact and energy and just feeling that animal out understanding how it views you, how you view it and how you can interact together. So started out with smaller one. It really wasn't different. I just know that just how much more adrenaline was just surging through my veins at that moment. <laughs> like this is, this could kill me. Like this is awesome. But which I don't recommend. To, what to what was people. the first venomous <laughs> snake that you handled? Uh, it was actually a prairie rattlesnake that I found, uh, just out in the desert when I was on a trip and it was, that was a step up. I was definitely really, really nervous back then. Now you give me a rattlesnake. I couldn't be calmer. <laughs> I just know exactly what I'm getting myself into and I'm prepared for that situation. Uh, but the other thing too, is like, I just recently started working with, with more cobras and the Alapid family. And that is different because they're built so differently, even though they are still snakes, their body posturing and their behavior and everything is so different. It's like learning a new language. It's like learning another Latin based language. It's like the basis is still Latin, you know, it's mm -hmm. still the same, but everything is just a little bit different. So like cobras, you know, they, they don't really in the same way when they actually go to, to bite, they don't strike out like a rattlesnake. They kind of just turn and bite. Mm. And if you're not ready for that, you'll put your hand in the wrong spot. Whack, they'll just turn. Wow. So little things like that, that you wouldn't think about. Well, I was going to ask you, like in all the snake hunting that you're doing in the Everglades, do you run into other snakes like cobras and other things? I mean, I know that, that people, <laughs> they have to be out there, man. There's probably everything is lives out there. What's the craziest one that you've run into in the, in the wild, like in the Everglades? Honestly, I've never seen really the invasive species that we see is pretty much almost exclusively Burmese pythons. The native snakes, we do have a couple venomous species that are around and, you know, same as anything else. You give them space, you're not going to have an issue with them. I know everybody's always are like cottonmouths chase people. No, they don't. Sorry. But I mean, I've been working, I've handled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cottonmouths. In fact, one time, my favorite story to tell about cottonmouths is one time I was, I was driving around road cruising, trying to find them crossing the road. And I found one with my friend who wasn't too experienced with snakes. And it was just a cottonmouth laying in the road. And I looked up at him and I said, Hey, remember these things chase people. And I walked up and just flicked its tail and it bolted off the road. <laughs> and he just, he was dying laughing, but I was like, yeah, you know, a lot of times in situations like that, People just don't understand what's going on. These snakes, Burmese pythons are the only snake around that in the United States, 
wild. It's the only snake around that could ever get anywhere near considering a human sized animal as a prey species. So every other snake you encounter is looking at you as you're the predator and they're afraid of you. They just want to be left alone. They just want their space. And snakes are the easiest animals to deal with. You just leave them alone and they'll leave you alone. You won't cause any issues. Even if that snake, chances are, if there's a snake in your backyard, it's been there for a long time and you just didn't know it was there because they're very secretive animals. And there's probably more there that you've never seen, but they're just there moving through, chasing prey items, you know, eating mice and stuff out of your garage or out of your wood pile. And you just leave them alone. Once there's no more food, they'll move on to a new area. Mm. And I think it, that's a, a very big thing is to then, you know, teach people to understand that these animals are a very important part of the ecosystem. A lot of snakes and a lot of reptiles like that are, are keystone animals. They really, they're the foundation that keeps that whole pyramid balanced. And you take them out and you could really do a lot of damage. And especially with stuff like rattlesnakes and species like that, they actually have a very slow reproductive rate. So, you know, we've seen this specifically when I was up north, I knew a lot about timber rattlesnakes up there. And we've seen historically massive population declines just from the killing of a couple of individuals because their reproductive rate is so low. So, and those, again, they're, they're apex predators. They're right up there. So they're very important to the the overall balance of the ecosystem. So if you see a snake, just let it be. That's really the point that that whole tangent was about. But I don't even know how we got here, honestly. Well, I, I mean, just just asking all kinds of questions. I wanted to know about your how you handled your first venomous snake because uh, and and, yeah. and just just like your your process of learning all of this that you know about. I mean, it's very obvious. Just like when you talk to a, a, a great fisherman. Um, they know tons of things about the the species that they're going after. They know what they eat. They know where they are. They know what temperatures they like. They know what their reproduction is like. They know yeah. everything about this because it's something that you're super passionate about and you start studying these animals. And the more that you know about them, the more effective you can be in both catching them and handling them and knowing, you know, predicting their behavior where they are. So it's no surprise to me that you would know so much about it. But I think that, you know, there, if I was to say that there was a misconception about, you know, uh, uh, python hunters or just even, even fishing guides, hunting guides, people like that, you know, a bunch of dumb rednecks, you know, and it's like, not really yeah. like these people like have a biologist understanding of the species that they're going after. They spend their entire life studying and pursuing these things. And when it, in fact, when it comes to a lot of the fisheries biologists and stuff, who's the first person they go to It's a fishing guide so that they can find the fish that they're after, because otherwise they would have no idea where to find these fish. Yeah. They, they're doing it. They're supposed to do a study on a fish. They have no idea where that fish lives or what, or how they can catch them over and over again. Same with the snakes. Like the the understanding yeah. that that you have of these animals and their behavior and what they eat and their reproduction is is really impressive. And and that you know Steve Irwin was a great 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 example of that. I mean he would be yeah. handling all of those animals and he would be spouting off all of this incredible information. He knew everything about every animal that he was holding onto. It was <laughs> wild. And, and I think that he, he not only captivated you, but he captivated a whole uh, generation of people that yeah. had tremendous respect for all of these animals that he was, you know, going after. And then he showed yeah. that he could do it in, in so many different ways. And he would go after the, the, the alligators and the crocodiles and then all these crazy snakes all over the world. But he was a, he was a really great um, kind of ambassador of, of that whole lifestyle, which, which you are too. You, I mean, you, you have a tremendous amount of knowledge and I wanted to talk to you too about what you do with the, with the gators, because you're working with gator boys from the animal planet show um, yeah. at the uh, Everglades Holiday Park, right? Correct. So what yeah. do you do there? So we do a combination of things. Uh, we work with nuisance alligators. Now, a nuisance alligator is one that showed up in somebody's backyard, swimming pool, front yard, something like that, canal behind someone's house. And the way that that works is if that person calls in 
If the homeowner calls into Florida Fish and Wildlife and says, hey, there's an alligator in my backyard, Florida Fish and Wildlife will say, do you feel threatened by it? They say yes. Immediately, a trapper is sent out to go catch that alligator. Now, trapping is done the same way as when we do our wrestling shows. You are a volunteer. You're not an employee of the state. So your payment is the alligator. So that basically what that boils down to is if that's a nuisance alligator, it's dead because their payment, the trapper's payment is that animal. So that trapper is going to take that animal to a processing plant, sell it for the meat, skins, bones, stuff like that. Now, our organization, the way that we started is that one of our members has a trapping license and he didn't want to kill him. He loves alligators. So he started rescuing them and started taking these alligators that would otherwise have been killed and keeping them in captivity, which by law, anything over four feet has to be either killed or kept in captivity. So as we keep all of ours in captivity, it kind of grew into a different thing. But remember, we're not getting paid for it. So that evolved into, okay, how can we make money while we do this? And we started doing educational alligator wrestling shows at Everglades Holiday Park. And so now that's what we do. It's a combination of, we will go and catch them you know, out of these circumstances that we get permits for, and we'll bring them into captivity and work with them for a while. And then we do our shows with them for a little bit and, you know, get them exposed to people and do that. And then send them out to one of the other parks we work with and retire them from Mm -hmm. their days of doing shows. It's interesting that uh, like the whole first half of this conversation has been dealing with invasive species, species that aren't supposed to be there. And then your other job is dealing with, you know, the American alligator. I mean, how could you get more Florida, more native yeah. than the alligator, right? So that's a kind oh, of an yeah. interesting. It's kind of an interesting thing. On the one hand, you're trying to exterminate. On the other hand, you're trying to to save. Um, how, is that you ever think about that balance? Like, or do you just love reptiles so much that you're just happy doing either one? Yeah, I mean it. I will say that with the work with the pythons, it's very bittersweet. You know, it definitely, every time we have to put one of those snakes down, like it it does really break my heart because they are beautiful animals. It's not their fault. They're not supposed to be here. It's people that cause the issue. But do I let that sympathy get to me? Then you're looking at, you know, an environmental disaster that we're not handling realistically. So somebody has to go in and remove as many of these as they can. And you know, I'm very skilled at it. And I know that that means I'm helping our native wildlife. So that's where that goes. But I do always have a lot of sympathy for them. Mm-hmm. And the alligators, again, I we feel bad for everyone that we have to take out of the wild because that animal is supposed to be there. And it's typically humans that cause the problem again. So really, it's kind of funny that most of my work with reptiles is actually trying to mitigate the problems that humans have caused. And as a result is affecting reptiles, but it is a fun little place to be in because I do get to work with these incredible animals professionally full time. And it's always been a dream of mine to do that. Mm. The situation might not be ideal, but making the most of the situation and really loving everything I do. So let's talk about the, the moment that you decide that you're going to start working with alligators. And I mean, how do you learn how to do that? Like I, I was watching one video and somebody said that you kind of start out working with a taped alligator. So the mouth is taped shut, I guess. I don't know yeah. anything about it. I would like to know how you started learning how to handle alligators. Yeah. So, well, first off, let me talk about how I got to Florida. <laughs> so fun fact about me, I actually have a bachelor's degree in finance and international business <laughs> from a college in New York. <laughs> and so I was there doing my degree. And long story short, I got a job offer to be an alligator wrestler at Everglades Holiday Park. Uh, my manager, Chris Gillette, you know, gave me the offer Cause he was like, I need a new wrestler. It's a very niche market. And I think you'd be great for it. And, you know, I'd been doing reptile shows for several years, like kids birthday parties and stuff like that. So I was already comfortable handling reptiles in front of an audience. So I, I pretty much was like, yeah, hundred percent I'm in. 
but I have to finish my degree because I had one semester left. So I finished the degree, moved down to South Florida. And honestly, I work with animals that can and try to kill me every day. Scariest moment of my life, moving to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Because I knew two people in the entire state and I left behind everything else I'd ever known in my entire life. But that's what you got to sacrifice when you get that once in a lifetime opportunity. So big risk, big reward. Wow. Now once I actually, yeah. That's so once super I cool, got, man. That, that is a, that is something that we talk about on, on this podcast quite often. You know, people that want to be fishing guides, people that want to be hunting guides, people that want to lately, I've been talking to these people that wanted to sail around the world. Um, and there's this moment where you have to make this decision. Like maybe all of a sudden this opportunity comes your way and you're like, Whoa, that means I'm going to leave everything behind. Uh, I mean, what was that like for you? Did people try to talk you out of it? Or like a, a lot of times it's well-meaning, you know, it's like your family is well-meaning. Yeah. Are you sure you yeah. want to do that? You got a degree in finance. Like you're going to go wrestle alligators. Oh yeah. But what was that decision? My mom like was like, you? my mom was like, Oh, you're going to wall street. Right. And I was like, <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, it was definitely, definitely a weird conversation to have. Um, but I just knew that I was never going to get, I, I pretty much knew I was never going to get another opportunity like that. And that's one of my big messages is just when you realize that you are never going to get that opportunity again, you have to grab that moment. And the thing was, you always have to kind of go into the mindset of no matter what, you're not going to, even if you fail, you got a backup, you got a safety net, you'll figure it out, especially if you're young you know that you have so many years to recover. You probably have people supporting you behind the scenes and stuff like that. So you're able to take that liberty and take that opportunity and run with it. So being, you know, just graduated out of college, I knew that was the perfect opportunity that if I was going to do this, I had to do it now. So I guess I'm probably pretty stubborn in that I, no one could even potentially talk me out of it. I knew how crazy it was. But I actually, I shot a little video right before I, I moved out of my college dorm. And I took a video in my empty college dorm room. And I just was telling people that right now I'm leaving everything behind and chasing my lifelong dream of being an alligator wrestler. And then I looked at the camera and went, whatever your dream is, it probably sounds more realistic than mine. And I'm still pursuing mine. And two years later, look where I'm at. You know, That's wrestling alligators full time, like catching pythons full time, just full time with reptiles, getting by, like being very comfortable, like very settled in my life and seeing a lot of, you know, people give me attention lately. And it's really good to get that gratification, just, you know, knowing, feeling accomplished that like I'm getting somewhere, I'm doing it. But it, I needed to take all of that risk and all that uncomfortableness, getting out of my comfort zone to get anywhere near where I'm at right now. Yeah, interesting, man. Congratulations, because that is that is really a, a, a something to to be very proud of. Like you really took uh, a, a a huge risk, and and that's where a lot of people stop. They get the opportunity, and then they then they uh, they bail on it. And it's like, yeah, that to me is the recipe for lifelong unhappiness, where you yeah. left something, and you you knew, man, I should have tried it. I should have, I should have at least given it a try and you don't. And it's, it's like yeah. this, you're living this life of regret where as you know what, even if it, even if things turned around and didn't go quite, quite so well right now, you know, you gave it everything that you had and, uh, yeah. and you would live happy right there because, yeah, because you 100%. did that, but it's probably not going to be that way. You're probably going to figure out a really good way to make a living doing this. You've got a, you've got other skills that, that probably aren't expected in your, uh, in your um, industry of a degree in finance, which I would imagine that could uh, could be a very um, helpful thing to figure out how to make a living doing something kind of off the beaten path or or, or yeah. different than other people. But that's that's super cool, man. That's super super cool. So in the in the alligator um, world, when that when you get down there and you start doing this, do do you just get thrown right into the fire or 
Like, yeah. what do you, how do you start wrestling alligators? Do you start with little ones? Because I mean, my experience with wrestling fish, sharks and barracudas and things that can bite you easily is I would rather handle a big one than a small one. The small ones are the yeah. ones that get you, man. They have, they have, 100%. Uh, they have very, um, they, they move differently. They have, you know, if you pull in a fish, like a small barracuda, a, a, a 25 inch barracuda, that thing is green as it can be. You get you get a twenty yeah. pound barracuda. The thing is, it it is very um, predictable in its behavior. I know exactly what it's yeah. going to do. I am probably not going to get bit by a twenty pounder, but I can definitely <laughs> get bit by a twenty incher. You know. So, yeah. how does that work with alligators? Is that kind of a similar thing, or where do you start? Yeah, it's very similar, actually. The bigger ones, really, what it comes down to is they just get less flexible the bigger mm -hmm. that they are. Yeah. So it's a lot easier. You have a more room for error because they're less flexible. Uh, the way that I started is I spent a couple of days just observing, you know, understanding, watching, you know, my, my boss, my manager handle alligators and seeing how he does it a little bit. And then he pretty much picked an alligator out of our group that he knew was probably not going to bite me. And he threw me on that one for no tape, none of that. <laughs> just this one probably won't attack you because he's he's been here a long time. He knows what's up. Jump on that one, you know, and you know, do the drills in the sand, you know, like so I know what I'm getting into. Jump on that and bas basically just work my way up from ones that are very habituated and aren't gonna try to kill me, just gradually increasing it towards the ones that will probably try to kill me. And it's just gradual like that. It, it's kind of the same thing. It, it reminds me of when I first started driving a car, my dad told me, he said, I would love to say you're never going to get in an accident, but that's not going to happen. He was like, but well, I hope that all of the accidents you get into are minor or very close. And you learn from those experiences, compile that information and move forward and become better at it. So it's the same thing with alligators. It's you're going to have close calls. It's inevitable, but it's those close calls that will save your life in the future from actually making a lethal mistake. So I've definitely had some close calls. I bet, man. I mean, you're handling alligators, what, three or four days a week? Um, yep. Uh, how many hours a day are you handling alligators? So we do, I work every, I wrestle every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, and when we're there, we get there at 9 a.m. and we leave around 6 p.m. So we spend that amount of time in the gator pit. Uh, in the morning, it's just, you know, cleaning and everything, getting ready. And then on average, we do between 12 and 15 alligator shows a day. Wow. So it's very rapid fire. Like we have, a, you know, we have a script, we know what we're doing, but you switch it up and use a different alligator every time the show is always different just because of that animal's individuality sure, and how they're feeling that day. Now, in addition to that, you are, you're also a, a state licensed trapper. So you're one of the people that gets dispatched when there's a problem gator or is that kind of, so our, there's only one trapper in our game, like in our little group. Uh, and that's Paul. Paul is our head trapper Everybody else is an assistant underneath him, whether they're on the license or off the license. If they have, you know, we can get our licenses and you can help out with him. We're pretty much always on call when we're not in the alligator pit. At any point, one of the other team members could call me and I got to run out and get it. So we, I typically say we have 10 to 12 open permits at any given time. Because it's typically, it's not like there's the alligator, go grab it. It's like, it's in the lake. Yeah. You can go find it. And it's like, oh, thanks. That really narrows it down to the water source, you know, their habitat <laughs> where they live. So <laughs> we pretty much any day that we want to go catch an alligator, we can go try to do it. Yeah. Well, I, I've watched Gator Boys on TV before, and then in preparation for this, I did some more research, and I was watching. and And Paul, man, he he likes getting in the water. He's the guy that that puts on the wetsuit and gets in the water and goes yeah. after. And then the, uh, some of the early shows, um, Jimmy, he would kind of stay out of the water, and he was he had his his way of handling them, and he was really good at handling them on land. But Paul would get in with a mask and fins and he would go after those things. And um, that's 
wild. I mean, that's pretty awesome. And I guess that when you get that experience, like it's the same kind of thing. You feel comfortable being around them in the water because you know enough about them to where they're predictable in your, in your, do you have a specialty like that? When you go, when you're dispatched to go get a wild alligator out of someone's swimming pool or their lake or the golf course pond, or I don't know, I would imagine you're going to all different kinds of places. Are you the guy that gets in the water or? So legally the way that the state words, the state really doesn't want people doing what Paul does. They don't want people going in the water after them and not to throw shade or anything, but remember that a lot of these rules and regulations are made by people in suits that have never handled an alligator before, have never handled a Python before. So there's a lot of wiggle room there where it's, it's not necessarily that the regulations are exactly because of something. It's a lot of times just the way that people think, but the state doesn't really want anyone going in the water except Paul. They say he has a special skill. If you talk to Paul, he will tell you exactly the opposite, which is also kind of, the state says he has a special skill. He's the only one that's allowed to do it. Paul says anybody can do it. It's not that hard, which I think the truth is a little bit in between those two. Yeah. Uh, I definitely wouldn't recommend anybody going in the water after an alligator if you don't have a permit, it's also a felony FYI to touch any wild alligator. Um, so don't do it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, well, that's interesting to know that that's a felony. I mean that, that, and yes. that would come from, uh, Florida fish and wildlife. They would be the, the prosecuting, um, uh, yeah. Enforcement agency. So even picking up a baby alligator is a felony wow. in the state of Florida. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're very, very protected. And I think a lot of it just comes from the the danger aspect. And you also have to come into think about the fact that alligators used to be federally endangered. So less than 500 individuals in existence in the wild. And they've made a huge rebound. It's one of the biggest conservation success stories that we have in the United States. But they're still always keeping a very close eye on that population and stuff like that. Are they on? In, so they're, they were on the the most endangered species list, right? Like what did yeah. you just classify them as? They, they used to be federally endangered. Federally was- endangered. And so I know that there are different uh, levels of protection that um, now, now what are they classified as just a species of interest or, or like something that gets special I would- treatment or. Uh, yeah. I, I would think they're least concerned, but they still have, you know, a lot of regulations surrounding them because they are potentially very dangerous animals. And we do always have to keep an eye on them. But our our estimates right now is that we have about 2 million alligators in the state of Florida. So their populations are very, very comfortable. Yeah. But still. What what about crocodiles? What, yeah, I what's get that your question experience a lot. with crocodiles because that is the that is the animal that is. Uh, I mean, I've seen maybe two or three alligators in the Florida Keys. Uh, I've seen quite a number of crocodiles, and yeah. at, at one point, if you saw a crocodile, you you would tell somebody. I'm pretty sure I saw a crocodile. They said, "No, it's an alligator." Um, but now they are showing up, and they're showing up in people's canals. They're showing up in people's backyards. They are a super protected species, um, probably yep. where the alligator was at the time when you're talking about there were only what 500 individuals or whatever you just yeah. whatever you said. Uh, the crocodile is is one of the most protected species that we have in the United States, I would imagine. So what yeah. what kind of uh, uh, experience do you or the Gator Boys, Paul, have with going out and and dealing with nuisance crocodiles? So the, the croc experience actually is not through the Gator Boys, but I do have a lot of knowledge on it because my old roommate used to be the head researcher on that project for the University of Florida. So I, I do know a little bit about them. I don't know nearly as much as the other topics, but our population estimate, we have about 2 million alligators versus 2,000 crocodiles. So that's a big disconnect right there. Um, crocodiles, though it's always been a rather small population. They only really live on just the Southern tip of Florida. 
they're not really that widespread. So there was never a huge population here to begin with. So you compile that with where they're at now. Uh, They really just live on the very Southern tip. There's not too many of them, but every once in a while people see them, especially now that there's a ton of protection around them. So it's very, they're very protected species. Their numbers are rebounding slowly, but surely we have a lot of research projects that go into, you know, tagging them and tracking them and all of that. But what we've seen, it's very, very rare for one to make a, make its way all the way up to where we're at. Mm -hmm. I'm in Fort Lauderdale. It does happen very occasionally. And in that situation, we just leave it alone because they're too protected. Uh, The way that nuisance crocodiles work is that they have a three strike policy. They will relocate that animal three times. If it continues to become an issue with people, they're going to try to put it in captivity. So it's a little bit different. But yeah. but going out and getting that animal and trapping it three times or catching it three times, that that's gonna be somebody like like you, for lack of a better uh term, somebody that's state licensed and contracted that has experience with probably a ton of alligators and they're gonna be dispatched to to go get that crocodile out of somebody's backyard that just ate their dog or or I mean <laughs> I mean, it happens in the, yeah. in the keys. Oh, it's yeah. Happened. Oh, and, it happens all the time. But I just wonder, like, that just seems, that seems like the difference between a black bear and a grizzly bear. Like, a black bear yeah. is, you know, pretty, I mean, it's a formidable animal, but it's nothing like a grizzly bear. And I don't know anything about handling an alligator or a crocodile. And I will, if there is any law that I have the least chance of, of uh, breaking it's touching an alligator or a crocodile. I have no (laughs) interest whatsoever in getting near them, but um, that just seems like a more aggressive species is in your opinion. Is that correct or what? Actually it's funny because we have never had a fatality from an American crocodile in the United States. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they're less aggressive or they're less dangerous or something like that. Because remember, there's only about 2000 of them in the state and you go down a little bit further South into, you know, central and South America, places like Costa Rica, they have people die every single year from American crocodiles, but the population is a lot bigger. Now, one of the big things to think about, especially when it comes to alligators in South Florida, everybody always just gets nervous about them and thinks they're just going to randomly attack people you always have to think about predator prey relationships when you're dealing with apex predators. Now our American alligators, they're not Nile crocs. They're not Australian saltwater crocs. They're not taking down wildebeest gazelles, these big animals. They're typically targeting stuff like ducks, turtles, fish, stuff like this big. So we're already way out of that normal prey item size range. So they're not naturally going to come after us. Now, there are ways that people can put themselves in a situation where that might happen. And there's really three things that we talk about there. It's number one is when you're swimming in the water. And that's because when you're swimming, most of the time, the only thing above the water is your head and you're splashing. You only look this big (laughs) and you're splashing. You look like an easy meal. Again, these are extremely opportunistic animals. Easy meal. They're going to take it. And most people are actually going to survive that encounter because the alligator miscalculates how big you are and they'll probably grab you, realize how big you are and then let go. But that's not going to be a fun experience either way. So swimming is one of them Uh, feeding alligators, which is also a felony in the wild, feeding a wild alligator. Then that alligator starts to associate people with food and it will actively start coming up to people. Not, it doesn't even have to be the same person. They'll just start coming up to people anticipating food. And they don't always necessarily make the distinction that like, You threw them a piece of chicken. It's almost like your hand fell off and they ate it. So, (laughs) yeah. And it's, yeah. So it's that. And then the the third way is people see what we do and they go, oh my God, that looks so easy. I could totally do that. We call it like the hold my beer club, Mm. trying to handle them. So swimming in the water with them, feeding them, we're trying to handle them. That's how people get attacked. As long as you don't do those three things, you're going to be fine. They're not naturally approaching large animals in the United States because that's not what they have access to. 
So they're not going after big animals like us. Small dogs, yeah, better watch out for those. Mm. We have that happen all the time that dogs get grabbed. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. So let me talk, let me ask you a question about, um, it seems like, you know, certainly watching Paul, watching Gator Boys, watching a lot of people handle alligators, there seems to be a technique to it. There's definitely a technique to it. But it seems to be yeah. associated with the way that the animal's jaw works. And I've heard this before, and I don't know if it's true, and it may sound very naive, but it seems like they're strong in one direction, like like snapping closed or whatever. And so that is why you can touch them on the bottom of their jaw. And like what Paul does is he kind of raises the alligator up, like just just kind of underneath their jaw, Yes, exactly what what and your what you do too. So, can you explain yeah. why there is a way that you can do that? Is it is it in fact that they are are really strong in one direction and not so strong in the other direction or why why is it that 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 technique works so well? So, it's it's a combination. That there's two things that come into play. One is the actual power and the other is something called tonic state. Mm -hmm. Uh if you're the same thing it, with sharks and we, exactly. we put sharks in tonic mobility, immobility, same with bonefish, same with yeah. all, a lot of fish will handle that way. We, you can turn them upside down and they, they're paralyzed. They will not move. So this yeah. audience is familiar with, with that. Uh, yeah. State. So, so a, a tonic state for an alligator is when its head is tilted all the way back. That's not a perfect science, but it's, it's kind of like a tonic state. It kind of, when their head is tilted all the way back, they just kind of, just kind of sit there. They kind of don't really know what's going on. It kind of stabilizes them a little bit. Um, and the other thing too is, is absolutely in terms of the, you know, whatever you want to call it, that like psychology or the, the concept that you can hold an alligator's jaw shut with just your hands. Yes, but there are more factors that come into play there. Most like there's several alligators in our pit that we work with that if they start shaking me around. I'll hold the jaw shut with one hand and I'm not worried that they're going to throw my grip, but there's a couple of different factors there. One, just like people and any other animal, there's varying strengths and abilities. So some alligators have really strong opening power compared to the other ones. And there's definitely a couple in the pit that are stronger and I can't hold them with one hand. If I try and hold them with one hand, they'll start to open and I got to switch to two hands to keep it shut. The other factor that comes into play there is it's not actually that, like holding the jaws shut. That's the issue. It's once they start shaking because their goal is to just wipe your hands off of their jaws, throw the grip. And some crocodilians are so good at it. And it really comes down to an individual variation. So one of the gators in the pit, his name is Ric Flair. And uh, Great name. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, he is so good at the shaking. I mean, he he's the best one in the whole pit. He's so good at it. And the first time that he really shook me as hard as he could, he popped my grip. My thumb went like in his mouth, hit a tooth, and I just got it back out of there in time with cat -like reflexes. <laughs> but but <laughs> was able to get out of there and made away with just a scratch. But yeah, that is an incredibly powerful move that they have. So always got to think about that. But mechanically, yeah, you push that head up, they start to go into that tonic state, close the jaws, hold on. And as long as he doesn't shake too hard, you should be able to maintain your grip. But there's other factors that come into play. We don't just walk up to an alligator and do that right away. It'll there's no way you're going to be able to hold on to it. It's too powerful. But a lot of the techniques that we use, well, when we're dealing with wild alligators that are brand new, very green, very fresh, do you really kind of have to tire those animals out before you can really work with them? And there's really, we separate it out. The wild alligators that we work with, it's almost like handling a different animal versus the ones that we habituate in our pit to do our shows with. Um, Cause when they're wild and they're fresh, they're very, very defensive. They don't understand what's going on yet. They've been basically abducted by aliens. They're still thinking we're going to kill them. So they're like going to try to kill us first to protect their own lives. They're fighting for their lives at that point. And then when we work with them in the pit, our goal is to get them habituated 
not domesticated, big difference, but habituated. So just used to the lifestyle to understand that what we're doing is not a threat to them. It doesn't actually endanger them. And they treat it as a minor inconvenience and they just kind of accept it. So you're almost dealing with, we separate it out. Like there's two completely different animals. It's one is literally going to try to kill you. And the other one is just bothered by you. So that both, kind both of distinction equally is, is dangerous though. I mean, bothered by you could oh, yeah. mean that it grabs your arm and doesn't let go. And, <laughs> you know, yep. thinking, fearing for its life, fighting for its life means it grabs your arm and doesn't let go. You know, I mean, equally dangerous, I would imagine. Oh yeah. Yeah. But definitely. I always try to, in every gator show I do, I'll always throw a little, little nugget in there of reminding people just how powerful and potentially dangerous these animals can be. Because we actually, I just filmed a segment yesterday with our media team at the park about how do people see our habituated animals and they see me just pick it up and just walk around with it. And it's not trying to bite me or anything like that. It's not trying to swing around and they go, Oh, it's easy. I could do it. And then I pull out one that's only been in the pit for two days. And before I even get it into the sand, it's swinging at me, open jaws, lunging. And I'm like, yeah, that's what they come in at. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about jumping on a wild alligator, that's what you're going to deal with. Not these lazy laid back, like, they're, they're so, they're adorable, honestly, <laughs> when you work with them and you see just how lazy they really are, it's adorable. They'll literally go like five feet and just lay down and take a nap and that's it for them. They're like, nah, that's enough. I'm good. <laughs> you know. But it takes a long time uh, for, I mean, it, is that going to be the same case at, at, on a wild alligator? Like if you start to chase a wild alligator down, it's not going to walk five feet and take a nap. It's going to, Oh no, it's no, no. That, to, that's that flight or flight, right. fight or flight. I mean, it's gone. It's out of there, you know, yeah. for the most part. Although I did see a video just yesterday of one chasing a fisherman on a, looked like on a golf course. And it was like at a full run and the fisherman was like looking back and then he was in a full run. I mean, he was a sprinting yeah. out of there, but I have never seen one be that aggressive. Like it, what would cause one to be that aggressive? So the, there's only really two factors that come into play here because that is not natural behavior. That mm -hmm. doesn't naturally happen because again, predator prey relationships, they're not targeting animals our size normally. So probably what happened is somebody has been feeding that alligator a lot and it's very used to coming up to people for food. And maybe that person has made it chase the food to get it before. So it's that. And the other thing is that American alligators do have very strong maternal instincts on average, there's actually varying degrees, just like with any other animal, especially people. Some of them are great parents. Some <laughs> of them aren't. But um, <laughs> so the, some of the times if you pick up a baby alligator and it starts, you know, meow, 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 that mom will halt, just come straight after you because she's fighting for her baby's life. She's going to protect it. And there's other there's other ones that are just they. They're, they're bad at it. They just suck. They don't care. They just, they're like, yeah, whatever. But so th there's two factors that come into play. And I have seen videos that fit that description with both behaviors. It's one, like you're holding the baby alligator and the mom just comes out after you or someone's fishing and they try and pull a fish out. And then the gator's chasing the fish and it's chasing the person. And it's a whole mess. Yeah. But <laughs> this one was definitely not chasing a fish. It was chasing the person. And, uh, and the guy did not have a fish on and, and the thing just came <laughs> after him. It, it was more probably along the lines of what you said before that the, the thing was, had been fed and this person yeah. comes along at the wrong time in the wrong place. And maybe, maybe the thing he starts running and it's like, Oh, I've got to run too, to get that food, you know? Oh like, yeah. It's, yeah uh, now it looks like he's chasing the guy, but this, this was the most aggressive I've ever seen an alligator <laughs> be. And it happened to be after a fisherman and, uh, it, I mean, who knows? That would be the last time I fish in that pond. That be <laughs> unless they were really big fish, and then it would be yeah. a real problem. But um, <laughs> anyway, man, this has been awesome to uh, to talk to you about this. I, I would love to talk to you again another time. Uh, we'll have you back yeah, on the 100%. show again because I felt like we barely scratched the surface on on what you do and and what you know and everything. But um, if people want to go and see your show, if they want to follow you on on social media, what what do they do? Yeah. So all of my social media is snakeaholic. That's Instagram, YouTube, stuff like that. Um, and I 
wrestle alligators every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I'll be doing shows at Everglades Holiday Park in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and this is South Florida thing, man. We're just down here having fun. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's very interesting too, because we talked about so many different things. And one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on the show is because you just caught the state record Burmese Python. Is that, that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So tell correct. me, so, tell me how big that thing was. Yeah. My roommate, Ryan, or feel the berm is his, you know, handle. We caught it together. It wound up taping out at 18 feet, nine and a quarter inches and weighed 104 pounds. And we pulled it out of about waist deep water at 11 o'clock at night, pretty much about 16 miles deep in the Everglades. Wow. So it was 18 feet long? 18 feet, nine and a quarter inches. So wow. getting close to 19 feet. Yeah. Wow. So the record will go on overall length? Yeah, that's what we, I mean, there, there's different, you know, records for everything, but that's the big one that seems to get the most attention is that length record. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we broke that the previous record. So now we, my roommate and I both hold that state record. Wow. That's cool because we have had, uh, a, another person in your profession, the Python cowboy, Mike Kimmel has been yeah. on, the, on the podcast too. And when I had him on the podcast, he had recently caught the state record, which was like 17 and a half. So is that the so, same record or what? Uh, this seems like it might be no, controversial. He, he, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> he caught the, at the time, the South Florida water management districts, Python elimination program record. So basically there's two programs. There's FWC and South Florida water management district. Each has their own team. Um, yeah, he caught the record for South Florida water management at the time, which his was 17 foot seven. Um, and we took his record out like a couple months later mm. with 18 foot nine. So, 18, nine. but it's the same, <laughs> but it's the same record though, right? Like that, that is the same, but not for the state. The, the reason it became such big news for us is because it broke the state record. That's the overall, it's the biggest one that's ever been caught in the state of Florida. Wow. The 17, seven has been beaten many times, actually. Um, many times, even in the previous year for FWC, the last summer we had two 17 foot nines caught within a week of each other. And then we had an 18, four caught the next month. So it's always been like right there where it's close to that record, but 18 foot nine broke the overall length record of any snake ever caught out of the Everglades. So that's yeah. why it was like much bigger news. Yeah. Something tells me that, 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 that record too will, will be beat just because, just because of all the things we've talked about, like oh, the yeah. availability of food, the amount of territory, the, the sheer growth of these snakes. Like it, it seems inevitable that, that there is a bigger one out there than that. It's just a matter of catching it, I guess. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And the big thing too is, is <laughs> my roommate Ryan and I in the videos, we almost made it look too easy because we are professionals at this. There are many people that have stories, especially in our contractor programs of the biggest snakes they've ever seen have gotten away. Mm. And it happens because these snakes are so, so powerful. I mean, the circumstances, I definitely, you know, Ryan and I work very, very well as a team. We've caught a lot of snakes together. We know what we're doing. We're able to get in there, get out and make it out safely and, and be really efficient at it. Those snakes are so powerful. So even, yeah, finding it is one thing. Now I've, I've caught, I'm getting close to 500 pythons now that I've removed from the Everglades. And of those 500, I've only ever seen one over 16 feet. And that was that 18 foot nine. Really? So that shows you how, how rare those really, really large animals are not even necessarily like their population wise are rare, but just running into that animal is a very rare occurrence to begin with. And then succeeding in actually capturing it is a whole nother ball game because they are so, so powerful and especially catching one in the water gets extremely dicey because yeah. it's so, so easy for them to just slip out of your grip and be gone. And it's happened to 
a number of people I know personally that they've lost very, very big ones that way. Wow, man. Well, I'm sure that you'll, uh, I'm sure that you'll run into some other ones. You're out there enough. You're going to all the right places. I'm sure you're studying their behavior and looking for the, for the biggest ones you can find. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm sure that it's, it's inevitable. You're going to run into them just like no different than running into big fish. Like if that's your job, yeah. that's what you do. Sooner or later, you're going to run oh, into one. Everything's going to have to work thing. out right for it to for for you to end up having it, like to to yeah. make the catch happen. Very similar, but uh, what's not similar is I like fish and I really don't like snakes. So <laughs> <laughs> I never ask anyone to like snakes. I just ask you to understand and appreciate. I ask you to respect them. That's what it is. I respect I them so people. much that yeah. I don't even want yeah. to see them. <laughs> yep, that's it. Because they're. Like these, again, these are invasive animals. That's why they're, you know, being removed and that's why they're in the light. Our native snakes, very important to the ecosystem. If you see them, just leave them alone. You'll probably never see that animal again. And it's always good to teach, especially younger kids, to teach them to accept that those snakes are going to be there. They're an important part of the ecosystem. Learn how to spot them, learn how to identify them and just avoid them and let them be. And the whole ecosystem will be a lot better off because of that. Got it. All right, man. Well, we'll definitely do this again. I really appreciate it. You guys go follow Snakeaholic. Uh, I like his Instagram a lot. It's very cool. Um, you have YouTube as well. Do you do yep, stuff on Snakeaholic, YouTube? Snakeaholic, same deal. All right. So all the social media platforms follow Snakeaholic. And uh, what would be even cooler is to go to that Everglades Holiday Park. They do all kinds of stuff. They got airboat rides. They've got the gator shows. They've got all kinds of stuff there. So definitely stop yeah. by. And where? tell people where that is, how they can find that. So it's, it's in Western Fort Lauderdale. So it's right off of I-75 and US-27. Um, so it's, eh, from where I'm at, it, it's a little less than a half hour west of where I'm at in Fort Lauderdale. So it's a little bit more inland, but it's, it's right on the edge of the Everglades. So it's a really, really beautiful location. And we really get to see some beautiful habitat out there as it is. The Everglades is such a beautiful ecosystem. Right on. Okay. Very cool. Well, thanks for spending so much time with us. I appreciate it. You guys go follow him and we'll be back next week with another great guest. All right. See you.